What is up? Welcome to the Stack Guy Show, episode number 19. Uh, the man to my right. Yeah, to that right. He needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one right now. So, this guy is the three time defending MPK champion, the defending America's List champion, the number one driver from the 405, and the guy who I like to say is the GOAT, Ryan Martin. How are you doing, sir? Well, I appreciate the kind words, buddy. <clears throat> I'm good, man. Speaking of the GOAT. Speaking of the goat, how does it make you feel when someone – I can't be the only one that calls you that. How does it make you feel when you get called that? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's I mean, it's kind of humbling, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, we try – I, you know, I don't know. I try to uh, – I think it's cool to be in a category to where you're great at something, and it probably – you know, hearing that for the first few times is probably what keeps driving me forward, trying to win championship, you know, another championship or whatever the case is. So, um, uh, it's – it's uh, it's weird, but on the same note, um, it kind of is what helps drive me to do what we do. So, Nice. Hell yeah. Uh, all right, let's get into something that's fresh on everybody's mind is you just got back from Australia. Um, talk about that trip. Talk about what uh, – how it didn't start off the way you had imagined it was going to start off. How'd that go? Oh, we're going to go. We're going straight to that. Oh, huh? yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, no, um, we did just get back from Australia. Uh, longest plane flight I've ever had in my life. Never thought I'd ever, you know, if I get on a plane for two or three hours, I'm like, man, this is going to be a long flight. But you never say that again once you get on a plane for 14 or 15 hours. Um, and that's, I think it took us 15 to get there. And plus, we jumped from, um, where'd we land first? I'm trying to remember where we landed first. We landed Sydney first, Sydney and then yeah, S Sydney and then to Perth. So it's five like, yeah, not, so it was 15 hours and then another five hours, and then we we're there, and then it, we're flying from track to track. So, um, it was a long trip, uh, but yeah, as soon as we got there, it was a it, that was a weird deal for me. So I got stranded in LA. It, it, uh, my flight from LAX did not leave like it was supposed to. We were on the plane, um, on the tarmac getting ready to take off like literally the next step was for them to throttle down and to send us off and of all things to happen in an airplane the toilets overflowed okay <laughs> so that's how my trip started out we're on the we're on the uh, plane getting ready to go the toilets overflow on the plane they turn the plane around and go back to the gate and when they went back to the gate they started doing the calculation of time you know like the crew has x amount of service time that they can be in that plane yeah. uh, and so with the added time of trying to clean the plane, fix the plane and do all stuff, the crew timed out. So there goes our flight to get to Australia to start with. So long story short, we end up sitting in a in a hotel room at the Westin LAX Westin for two days, basically almost three days before we ever got to make it. So wow, everybody else is there and I'm hearing how, you know, they're going around petting koalas and going to some <laughs> island that has these crazy animals and all this other stuff. And we're back at LAX still. So I'm anxious yeah. to get there. Um, we, we basically finally get the flight lined out. We get there. The flight went smooth. We didn't have any problems. Um, we hit the ground running basically the day before it was time to test. I think we tested on, if I can remember correctly, I think we tested on Thursday for the first time and we landed Wednesday late. So go to sleep, wake up, go test. Um, track was green, untouched, uh, you know, it, we race on stuff like that all the time. So I'm not going to say it's sketchy. It's just what we're kind of used to, you know? Um, and the passes were okay. Like from the very first pass, I let go of the button. It went, made the trip. It moved around a little, no big deal. Uh, second track, second, second hit made the trip. Uh, I turned it up a little bit. So it was a little faster, but it wiggled a little bit on the shutdown. I thought, oh, okay, that's kind of weird. Third pass, my fastest pat yet, pass yet. Cause we kept turning it up. And then as soon as I let off the throttle, it made a hard left move and into the wall. Um, I don't know what caused it for sure. I keep looking at video, you know, you, as a driver, I haven't had ever had a crash, you know? So when it comes down to any of, you know, since I've been doing street outlaws, you know, that's 10, 11, 12 years now that we've been into doing this stuff. And, um, you know, one of the things that I always, I think as a driver, when you go, Hey, you like, I'm not saying I, I don't, you know, I'm not the best driver that there ever was, but you, you got to think, you know, Hey, I can, I can take care of myself in crazy situations if I have to. I couldn't do anything about that one. Uh, yeah. Nothing that my skill set gave me could keep me out of that wall. I tried, and and it didn't matter. But after looking at the videos, the the rear tires were basically locked up. Um, I I went over. I was remember laying in bed the night that I crashed, and I pulled. I said, 
hang on, I wonder if like for whatever reason I hit the brakes, like because I never hit the brakes on the shutdown. I either live, I either use the parachutes or I wait to the very end before the turnoff. I finally grab the brakes and and so I got up at like two or three in the morning and opened the laptop and I have a brake pressure sensor on the car. No brakes. I didn't didn't use the brakes until after I hit the wall and then came back to the middle and then you can see where I stopped the car. So I don't know, man. We we changed a bunch of parts. Um, the third member was a little bit weird. We changed it. I don't know. I, I still really don't know exactly what it was, but I can tell you there was a lot of um, kind of the perfect storm for not the best racetrack, you know. Uh, yeah. But there's no excuses there. That's what we do. I mean, we race on those all the time. So, uh, unfortunately, it cut my very first event short. So, first day I'm there, we didn't really get over there like we wanted. We didn't get there as fast as we wanted to. We didn't have any time to settle in and then start hurrying around, testing the car and crash it. So that's yeah. how my that's how my trip started off. When you uh, when you got the car back to the pits and you kind of uh, looked at what was all wrong, what was going through your mind when you realized when you got to the point you realized I cannot race the car in its current condition? Um, man, there was a lot of things. I mean, I, you know, for me, I think the very first thing I thought was like, man, I'm not going to get to race while I'm over here. Like we came to Australia, I brought a perfect car over here to race small tire. My car runs pretty good on a small tire. And I came over here and I crashed it and I'm going to have to sit and cheer my buddies on while they are racing against Australia. And that was literally my mindset for a while, because when I looked at it, you know, when we first pulled the clip off of it. My very first initial thought was who in Australia is going to have a front clip for this car? Probably right. nobody. And turns out I was not wrong. Nobody had a front clip for that. Right. Um, there was a couple that were close, some stuff on a boat on its way over. But even to date, nothing that made it over yet, you know, Um so then I start, you know, you know, so we pulled the front, all the front carbon out of the way, pushed it over to the side, just started unbolting parts. And we got, you know, it, it took, it hit the blower because the blower, something hit the blower, maybe the fuel tank went in the blower or something and it broke into the appeller off and took a little chunk out of the, out of the uh, housing of the blower. So we pulled it off, pulled the drive off, pulled the fuel tank off, anything that was bolted to the front of that thing, we pulled it off so we could just kind of look at it. And, um, the bottom lower frame rails were bent over pretty good. Um, they were up into the driver's side. Um, it looked like it was very hard to tell, but from my initial thought, I was thinking, okay, wait a minute. It's from the straight, it's from the strut forward. Uh, if I can find a good chassis shop, I can probably get this back together. I probably won't make it to the next race, but I bet I can get two out of four of these and I'll at least be able to help my team, you know, for those two out of four races. Yeah. So, and the people in Australia, you know, I don't know if you've heard, but we all say, like, how nice everybody is. Well, they really were. I mean, you know, before I got the car back to the pits uh, off the tow truck, I had chassis guys coming over this way, this way, going, hey, I'll help you fix it. Hey, I'll help you fix it. Let's take it to my shop. Take the tow truck, and I'll have them follow me, and I'll go to the shop. I was overwhelmed with, which is a great problem to have. I was overwhelmed with, where do I go? I don't know any of these people. Um, I'm sure there's – Perth has a bunch of talented chassis shops – uh, and, and, you know, luckily my buddy Frank, uh, who lives over there, who I became really good friends with while I was there, I just, he was on his way to the track. He hadn't even made it there yet. So he didn't even get to, he didn't get to watch me race or nothing. And I had to call him and go, Hey man, uh, I wrecked the car and we got to figure out what to do with it, how to fix it. And you're the only dude that I know that I can trust in Australia. And it's not even that I didn't trust other people. It's that like, you know, when, it, you know, when you're going to build something, you go try to figure out who you want to build, whatever it is you're building. I don't care if yeah. it's a house, a shop, a car. It doesn't matter. You want to get the right person. Right. And especially from a car like that, like, you know, that car worked so good. The last time we had it on the street, it drove good. It was mint. There was nothing wrong with it. So for me, that's how I like my stuff. It was really hard for me to see it like that. But on the same note, I knew step one is get it mechanically to where it was right. Yeah. Um, so Frank – with Frank's guidance, we made a decision that night and we tore apart what we had to tear off of it. It loaded back in the container and then the semi truck picked it up. Uh, the container transport company picked it up that night, which was Thursday night. I'm sorry, Friday morning. They picked it up Friday morning and took off to Sydney. And for y'all that don't, you know, that are not uh, familiar with Australia or the distance between Perth and uh, Sydney, it's about 3,000 miles roughly. So that's a really long, it's in the way I looked at it and I could be wrong in, in uh, by a few miles, but it's like going from Boston to California, you know, yeah. it was, it's, it's forever. So I knew that step one was I needed to get it over on that side of the country 
because there were other chassis shops there that we we're thinking about using. Plus, that's where the next three races were, was on that side of the country. So that's what we did. So we shipped the car off. So unfortunately, had an issue, wrecked the car, shipped the car off, put it in the container, and sent it to the other side of Australia. <laughs> and while we stayed there, and then the next day, the event started. So, you know, needless to say, I got to spend time with fans. Um, yeah. I got to help the guys. I, you know, we helped negotiate some races and, and, and I was happy to be part of it, but me not racing, that's not, that's not what I do. I mean, I don't not good at showing up places without cars or anything like that. So mm -hmm. it got to me pretty good. I, I was in a pretty terrible mood for the, for that first race track, but, um, I can imagine. but we, it ended up all being okay. Yeah. So after that first race, you then left and where did you go? So we went to Sydney and um, I ended up, ended up enlisting the uh, guys at Moit's uh, race cars to help me out. Um, you know, turns out that once you talk about chassis shops and guys in Australia that do a great job, they're the number one pick for everybody. You know, that's who you take your car to if you want it to be right. And when I walked in the place, I could figure out there's three or four pro mods sitting over in the corner and three or four cars on jigs and street cars getting built. You know, of course, a totally different variety of um, things that we have over here. Uh, you know, there was a Mustang or something like that in there, but it was most it was Moneros and and XRs and things like that that, that, the, that those guys do, which was really cool for me because, well, you know, the first day we landed, we actually beat the car. So even after going to the event, doing the deal, jumping on a plane Sunday morning, we beat the car there. So we showed up at the place kind of twiddling our thumbs going, man, this place is awesome. Where's my car at? You know, yep. and finally it showed up about three o'clock on Monday. And uh, I mean, we didn't waste any time. I think all three, four of us dug it out of the, out of the container, um, put it, put it up on the lift and just started tearing it apart. Uh, we had motor transmission, full suspension, everything out of it in about three hours. And it was bolted to the jig table by about six o'clock that evening. Wow. But we knew, look, it, it, and, and Glenn is, is who runs Moitz, and, and Glenn and Bill and Costa and, and Luke are the main guys there. They do, they do great work, and, and Glenn is who runs it. So I told Glenn, I said, hey, what's the odds we can get this thing back together for the next race? And he was like, man, I think if we'll all work on this thing, he's like, I think we can pull it off. And so we knew, no sleep, right? And we knew for three or four days – we we're going to get very minimum hours sleep. Um, our hotel was 30 minutes away, so we had that drive back and forth every day. Uh, but all of us would show up in the morning and leave at 4 or 5 o'clock if we had to um, to do what it did. But the first day, um, we had pretty much uh, – they they were they had the lower frame rails put back in it. Um, and all the – everything except for, like, tabs – and the control arms were back on it, but it was a really weird deal to crash. The struts didn't get damaged. The control arms did not get damaged. So we reused, we were, we were, and that's the only reason why this worked out. We were able to reuse a lot of the parts. Right. And so the second day was used to put tabs on it, um, put all of the mounts back on it, um, motor plate, mid plate stuff. It bent the mid plate up pretty good because it kind of jerked the motor in there sideways. Uh, yeah. But um, you know, by day three, uh, we had the, we had the, um, jig pushed outside. Um, our boy nugget came over and, uh, painted the chassis like back black, just like it was. Um, by then you couldn't even tell it was crashed. I mean, the, the, uh, front clip, of course, that's a whole nother thing, which was out of, out of control. I'm trying to find a front clip and I can't really find one. Um, a really nice guy in Perth brought his – what's his name? What was his name? Dan, uh, what, was his, what was his last name? So a, a really nice dude came over, brought me his car, and he said, hey, if you need this car, it was a really cool twin turbo 68 Camaro with a 481X in it. And he said, number one, if you want my car, here it is. You can have it for the rest of the event. I'm weird about driving people's cars. I just wadded mine up. The last thing I want to do is crash somebody else's, you know. Yeah. And so – uh I said, man, I appreciate it, you know, and his car's beautiful. It was red with black stripes. It was parked in my pits. And so everybody that came by were like, well, we thought you wrecked your car. And I was like, yeah, well, I did. This is not really mine. This is somebody else's car. Long story yeah. short, we ended up, uh, he loaned me his front clip because we thought we were going to have to, like, we didn't know what we were going to do. So we thought, well, there's no way you can fix the other one. 
So, you know, he loaned me the front clip to, um, to, to basically possibly cut up if I had to and use, you know, and, uh, we hauled all the way across the, the country to Sydney with the car and got it over there. And like a day or two into us working on the frame, I just don't pay attention much to the carbon guy that's there. So Terry, this, this, this guy named Terry, who's amazing with, uh, with carbon work. And just so I don't forget the name of his place is, uh, is I am composites technologies. I am composite technologies. T Terry Jackson's the guy's name. He's outside puzzle piece in this front clip back together. And I, I look and I'm like, man, like he's got the fenders where they're all in one piece again. Like the fenders were cut in half. Now he's, He's got them back together, and you, other than the fact that the color's not right, you can't really tell that they've ever been blasted apart. That's awesome. What that dude does with carbon, I, as an artist, man, I don't even know how anybody could do it. But long story short, he ended up taking our our uh, our guy's 68 Camaro mold, and when my car nosed into the wall, it splintered the front cap of it. And when it splintered the front cap, it was gone, right? It just kind of blistered into a bunch of pieces. So he had to take a mold off this guy's clip right there at the shop and took it over and made another piece like the front cap off of a 68. It's crazy, man. The, the way he, what he did, wow. it was amazing. But, you know, it worked out because if I didn't have that front clip, I don't know if he would have had a mold. And, um, you know, long story short, he he made that thing. It's on the car right now. I raced at the uh, as a lot of you guys know, I raced at the next three races. We made it to the second race and raced all the races and we did good car goes straight it works just as good as it did before never had another hiccup since nice man that's amazing it's a crazy um, story if i didn't see some of the stuff myself in person there's some things yeah. that they pulled off that i didn't think you could do so wow that is amazing yeah um without getting into too much details um like you said you raced the the, the last three races yeah um and i saw a bunch of live feeds T talk about was the was the competition what you expected to be more less um you know i don't want to sound like i'm talking you know like i'm talking smack about the australian guys or anything like that i i figured the racing would have been a little tighter than it was um but there were things to make up for that there was a lot of negotiation um a lot of okay i'm going to give you a hit i'm going to give you a car link and a hit or i'm going to do a drive by or whatever the case is and it, and it made it really fun and different than what we normally do uh yeah. so we made up for the differences and you know look let's just be honest the guys and i've said this time and time again you know you you look back at you take accumulate all the mpk drivers all the america's list drivers all the uh drivers from mega cash days and and you put them all together and you really have some of the most versatile group in the world of people that can do anything on any surface. All right. Yeah. Australia don't really do that that much. So like to say that they're behind is not, I don't even know if it's really fair. They don't race like we race. They don't, they're not forced to be on hell. We, you know, there's some times where I think we could get down gravel roads if we had, if we had to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so to say that they weren't ready is not really, not really fair. They just don't do what we do. And so when we got there, the game was that, you know, you don't prep the track because that's what we came there to race the track. Like it was. Yeah. So, um, but I thought it's it's going to be a good show to watch. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was it was a crazy experience racing with guys that I'm always racing against. I don't right. get to, I don't get to race with Kai. I don't get to race with Scott Taylor. I don't get to race with anything. I got to race with them, you know. And it was cool for a change to cheer those guys on when they did good. Um, you know, they all were there to that offered help if I needed it, and so it was just a different experience for you know. But it was a, it was a cool experience, but it was just totally different. Yeah, I saw uh, I saw Boosted partaking in what they call shoeies over there a few times uh, on some live feed. But, Did you partake in any uh, other yeah. any of the other Australian customs that they have? I don't know. I had to think about that, but just the shoey thing was the fact that he did that was, I couldn't believe they told me he did it. And I was like, nah. And then I see a video of him doing it. So then I have to ask him like, man, did you really do that? He's like, oh yeah, it was a lot more graphic than that. But that really made my stomach turn. Cause she came up to me at the trailer. She said, Hey, I want you to do a shoey with me. And for first of all, I was like, Oh, what? And she's like, well, I, she pulls her leg off oh. and says, Hey, 
um, there's a, there's a, here's my prosthetic leg and I want to pour a beer in here. And I'm like, no, I cannot do that. <laughs> and then she sent me a picture of Boosted doing it. So uh, it was crazy. And then she tried to hold it over my head. She's like, well, Boosted did it. So you need to do it, you know? Uh, but shoeies are a thing. They're a big thing over there. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that. Yeah. Um, would you say overall as an event for the TV show and, and street outlaws, do you think it went well enough that they're going to try it again, maybe in a different country? Um, I think we all realize that that always has to do with ratings, right? So like if the show does well, if everybody watches it and they love it, you know, which I, you know, we're going to get our core, Street Outlaw fans that are going to watch that. I think they're going to really enjoy it. I hope that it brings a lot more people in and and just, you know, maybe pulls a lot of the fans together that maybe just vote. They just uh, they just cheer on Kai or they just cheer on me or they just cheer on Sean or they just cheer on, you know, cheer on Jeff. Puts us all together because that gives them a reason to cheer for us all. Um, you know, that being said, I think they will. Um but I think it depends on ratings. Uh, that's already talked about, you know, like I think the idea, the big grand scheme of thing is to go to a different place as much as we can. There's a lot of countries that do street racing, drag racing, and how cool would it be to be on a team that got to experience that at a different country every year? I mean, I, I can only hope that's what we end up doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. That would be amazing, man. That would be yeah. really good. Um, all right, so let's switch gears a little bit. Yep. Uh, let's talk about the upcoming No Prep King season six. Okay. Um, so since last time we talked, I've heard you got you're going to be running a twin turbo. I've heard you're going to be putting a screw blower out of your hood. Um, I was hoping you're going to let me announce what you're actually going to do because I have a great idea for you and what I think you should do. Okay. Well, I would like to hear your idea first. I'm thinking to make it fair for everybody, we're gonna you're gonna run a big block, naturally aspirated, no power adder. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> Is it like a 500-pound car or what? It's the only way to make it fair. Um, man, I think with everybody else, like, there's, like you know, look, we've all talked about what are we going to do? Like, the rules haven't dropped. What are we going to do? And, yep. you know, I sold my two motors from last year, the two motors that I used to win the championship with. I sold them right away. There was some new stuff coming down the pipeline. Um we didn't know if it was going to be better yet or not. Uh, but, you know, to, to try to stay ahead, you got to try to stay on top. And that's one of the things that we do. That being said, I sold the whole engine pack, you know, two whole engine packages, knowing that I could change. You know, I could always, well, you know, the Hemi, the, the, the rumors of the rules indicated that a twin turbo Hemi could possibly be a pretty good combination and might have an advantage. And then, of course, the screws, not knowing what they were going to do with the screws, um, that combo proved itself to run really good. Uh, Jim Howe made that car run good. The Swanstrom made it, made that made that combo run pretty well. Uh, Odom made that that combo run pretty well. So, um, you know, that was always in the back of my mind. Uh, you know, hey, is this? I mean, if it's just like anything else, you watch the rules enough. There are some unfortunate cases where, if you don't have, for instance, if every damn car don't have a screw it's going to be it's going to be tough to compete and i was and i always hoped they didn't do that because i didn't want to be forced into a thing to where i had to run what the other dude ran just to be competitive with him because what i had wouldn't after the and, and i gambled right so my gamble was keep a pro charged combination in the gray car um the gray car is a really good car i have told everybody and i and i firmly believe this that car with a screw would be fast depending on the weights and things like that. Um, I gambled that the, that the rules would possibly even up a little bit. Uh, and they're not very, they were never very far off. If we raced the same exact rules again, this year as we did last year, I probably would have stayed pro charger no matter what. Um, but make a long story short, the gray car has got another pro charge combination back in it. Um, <clears throat> there is, you know, we, we joke and, and, We've got all of our turbo stuff still. We've got our turbo headers. We've got our waste gates. We've got all of our pipe. We've got everything to put turbos back on the car. So when the rules finally came out, turbo cars are going to have an advantage. Uh, I don't know that that means – I'm not sitting here saying that that's a better combo. I'm just saying that they have a better chance of being competitive this year than they had last year. Um, small block, big block, billet cast, 
Um, Jeff's car, Jeff's combo is going to be tough, in my opinion. Like that car is going to be one that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and I've been saying it, and I and I could see the writing on the wall that it was coming down because you know turbos haven't done great. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff ended up where he was in points, showed that it could be competitive, but turbos yep. haven't won since one with turbo combo. So. I knew that it was coming down the pipeline that that was they were gonna they were gonna try to even the playing field with those again. So, uh, Jeff Jeff's car is gonna be one we're gonna have to watch. Um, anybody that changes to the twin combo is gonna be tough, I think. Um, but it is sure hard once you get a handle on a race car with a screw or with a pro charger to out three thirty those cars, and mm-hmm. that's what the turbo guys will have a have a problem but i think for now we're gonna and look everybody knows i mean i haven't done it but you know i'm not scared to sling turbos on this thing in the middle if we go through here and just say hey we can't compete with the pro charger then we'll take a couple of weeks uh during some time off and show back up with turbos on it but right now i think we're gonna stay with the pro charge combination nice um i had watched uh swanstrom came up with a video I think this past weekend with mm-hmm. basically read the rules um, mm-hmm. to the T of what they were. And there was a lot of cool new things in there. Um, one of the things I noticed was that like he talked about was every three week, three races, they're going to kind of take a step back and see how the combos are all doing and maybe change some rules. What are your thoughts about that? Cause that's not, that's never been done yet. Uh, it's always been talked about, but they've never done it. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, you know, you got a guy who, um, take me out of the equation and you got somebody who works hard on a program and, and, and and look, this has happened before, but you take five, you take 10 pro charge combinations and put them all on, put them all on the same sanctioning event and you let them run a season or screw combinations. Even you let them run the season because Jim, how did this too? Um, They don't all run the same. It just is what it is. And it doesn't matter whether it's like, to have 10 combinations and to say that 10 cars are going to be perfectly set up and 10 motors are going to be tuned just right, it's that doesn't happen. So okay. you've always got the dude that's got the mixture of everything put together who's going to be, a, who's going to be at the top. He's going to be the forefront. Um, whoever that is, if they sit back and watch and they go, okay, there's been three races and this dude won three in a row, it's going to be tough to not target an individual that way. Um, yeah. You know, because, you know, when we had guys doing the same thing with us when we did really well with the Pro Charge combination. But, you know, you could put 100 pounds on me, but then you're going to put up 100 pounds on the guy that finished 10th with the same combo, you know. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I, I do think their goal is they're trying to be as fair as they possibly can. Um, yeah. And that's something that they did to be fair. Uh, there's a lot of There's a lot of talk. Look, whoever runs good, doesn't matter who it is, they always get the finger pointed at them. They've got special parts. They've got this. They've got that. They've got whatever. Um, but, you know, uh, maybe this will give everybody a little bit of leap of faith that if they really think that, then they'll do something about that, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. We'll see. That, but yeah. you're right. That's one thing that they've changed that's that's definitely different. Another big change I saw, and it will affect – a lot of you guys, especially the top running guys from last year, was going from a 36 inch tire down to a 34 and a half. Yep. Um, who, I know, I know, some guys aren't going to have any data. Do you have any data on a 34 and a half? And is it your goal to get a lot more data now <laughs> before the season starts? Yeah. So um, no, I don't. Um, I've ran on a 36. I mean, honestly, I think I ran on a 36 when nobody was really doing it back in yeah. four years ago. You know, I think about the second, I think the, if I can remember right, the first season of MPK, we came out on a 34, five and it might've be, it might've even been a good year. I had a bunch of data on a 34, five at that point in time, but it was all with a twin turbo combo. Um, when we made the switch to the 36, we just didn't look back. Uh, and what I think about the tire rule is, it's going to be tough to get, I mean, I've already found out just trying to find them. It's tough to get them. So that's oh. the number one problem is that um, right now there's not very many. To, if you go out there and try to find them, there's not very many around. Um, mm-hmm. And it depends on what combo, what, you know, what tire compound you run or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But like, let's take my program, which the whole thing's based on, a, you know, I've ran 30, just like we talked about, I run 36 is forever. So now you're going to throw me on 34.5. Well, 
it's going to be a learning curve for us. I think we're going to handle on it pretty quickly, but everybody, it's, so there's a couple ways to look at it. You go, okay, well, everybody's got to run on that 34 five. And that is true. Everybody's got to run on 34 five. But the problem is you take guys like I'm going to bring up Jeff. Well, Jeff spends all his time on a 34 five. Yeah. Yep. So this ain't going to do nothing for him. Like he's not going to ever notice that this happened, which again is a combo that I think is going to be uh, hard to mess with already. And then you, you 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 bring up the fact that he doesn't have to change his tire or he, ha- he doesn't have to get used to it. And then all of a sudden you've got a guy who really has his stuff together from last year who's just who's just repeating what he did from last year. So it's going to affect some of us dramatically. Uh, some guys it's going to take – it's going to take a little bit to get a handle on that tire. And some guys, they're not ever going to – they're not going to skip a beat because they're never even going to notice that it was a difference. Yeah, yeah. Um so with the grueling schedule and the lack of parts and everything this year, have you thought about like what's the plan with the fireball? Are you have you thought about bringing it with you um, event, in case you need it? I haven't, th- not really bringing it with me. You know, we did that once last year. Was that last year we did that, or was that year before last? I don't know. It might have been year before last. We raced both cars at one event. And we're just kind of playing around. Ago. Yeah, yeah. It. Uh, I'm trying to remember which track that was. Um, anyway. It was hell. It sucked because it was hard to keep up with two cars. We had two crew, two, two crews because we had two cars. So we had two guys dedicated to each car. And of course, you know, I'm lucky enough that I have a bunch of friends that like to go racing. So it was all my buddies that were doing it. And, and then I was getting on a golf cart going back and forth with the cars. I would never do anything like that again. And then I'm also weird about hauling my two prized possessions in the same trailer. Yeah. Right. So, You know, for me, that's what, you know, keeps me rolling is those is those tools that I have to go race with. And unfortunately, like statistically, we're on the road a lot, you know, and more so than most other uh, racing organizations. So if I got both my tools that could keep me racing in the same trailer and I have an issue, God forbid, hopefully that never happens, um, then you could take out both cars at the same time. So I'm going to try not to do that. Uh, we are going to use the fireball as a tool for this year, um, at the very least a testing tool, um, because I have it at my disposal to do that. So uh, I don't know what it will have yet exactly or what it's having. We don't know. But uh, we're going to use that to try to make our program better for sure, but probably not at the same time. I feel like the the fireball is kind of not getting any attention anymore. It's not. Not racing, it's not no more big tires on the street, and he's not racing no prep kings anymore. Yeah, and I don't feel like that's a permanent thing. I mean, number one, I, I would never get rid of that car anyway for the, some of the things that we've, you know, that I've been able to do in that car and we've accomplished with that car and things like that. Um, but I feel like everything comes full circle. So right now, I know there's a lot of small tire racing, and 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 you know, with my 69, we kind of dedicated that to a small tire car so we didn't have to flop back and forth. Uh, thinking that we would go back doing some big tire racing, even though we haven't, you never know when that comes back around. Um, I'll tell you, me personally, we've had a great time with small tire stuff and it's been awesome. But if you called me today and said, Hey, there's a $20,000 big tire race on the street. And I mean, we want to go, you know what I mean? So uh, it's just not as popular right now, or it's not what the show's focusing on. So it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not in front of us but I definitely wouldn't write that out. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, and you probably thought about this forever since you were on Street Outlaws, for how many seasons and years, all you raced was the fireball. Yeah. And literally in the past year now, because of us, did you think the show was ever going to get to that point where you would need four other cars for the show? <laughs> no, I didn't. And, and you know, guys that are good with their money, and, got, you know, we joke around about this all the time, but, like, would say, well, why do you don't need four cars? But, like, a lot of these damn – you know, things that we do in the different shows are so, they're so different. I couldn't yeah. use one car for the other, you know, like that, that, uh, the 405 show that we did, uh, that was a street based car, a street based show, you know, for, for the cars. And I don't have a car that would fit in that. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, I did my Chevelle for the end game and it's pretty cool, mm-hmm. but I never wanted to put a cage in that car. I wanted that to be like my fun family cruiser, you know, and that's what we do with that. And yeah. so when that show came up, they were going, well, Hey, some of you guys may have – I can't remember the exact deal, but in a, in a nutshell, it was like safety was kind of a concern. You know, we were going to try to go 
five O's and five fifties on the street, five O's to five fifties on the street on a 28 with a heavy car. You know, I wanted to have a roll cage in what I had. So I really bought another car. So I would have something with a little bit of safety in it, you know? Yeah. 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 No, but no, I, 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 and I, I know that was a long, long way to get to your question you asked, but no, I did not think that it was ever going to end up here. I'm thankful that it is, you know, like we could be talking about worse problems, but um, oh, yeah. having the opportunity to, to race all these different shows and look, I like cars. So when it comes down to it, I have to, if I have to have a car for each show, it is what it is. <laughs> Might as well. Yeah. Um, since we're on the, uh, you mentioned your, the daily driver in the 405. But yeah. Last time we were, we came on the show, um, we were like two episodes into the season of the 405 show. Yeah. Um, so how did the show go overall? How did you, how was the experience? How was it having everybody back? The 405 show was, if not the, one of the most fun shows that we've had this, as far as the season goes, mm -hmm. it was one of the most fun seasons that I've filmed while I've been on Street Outlaws. Um, I hope that, you know, transpired over to viewership and, uh, and things, but just being able to go cruise these cars, I don't know. And, you know, I think a lot of it had to do with like things change, times change. So, Forever, we're race car, race car, race car, race car. Pull your car up to the line. Go blast the three-second pass. Pull your car back to the trailer. Cool it down. You might get to go do it again. Well, this way, we get to go cruise around. We go through, you know, like I have a vivid memory of rolling through downtown Chickasha um, on our way to one of the film sets to go film the show. And, like, that's the – I've never I've never gotten to do anything like that. So, um, for me, it puts, it puts it back in perspective. Of that's what started us to do these to for our love for cars was that's what we all used to do back in the day. And and then we'd drive the street racing spot. We'd go street race and then we'd, you know, and and I think we all grew up doing that. And that's what got us into this. So for me, it took it back a little bit. And and it was a challenge to have a car that you could drive for 30, 40 miles without overheating or falling apart or whatever. And make it to a spot, go race it all night and maybe drive it home. And a lot of us had the opportunity to do that. So I hope we get to do that show again. I hope we get to do that show from the next 15 years. But, you know, uh, only ratings will tell us that. But it's um, it was very enjoyable for me. And then it's not as, oh, you know, cutthroat to where I'm trying to cut the other dude's head off that's next to me. Uh, yeah. We had a good time. We were competitive. But in the end of the day, you know, it um, we just it was just a fun show. Yeah. No, and that's a cool perspective on it because – when it came out and I watched it and I loved it, um, the only thing I could think of was, all right, these guys are so like highly competitive and they don't have to be most of this year. They're on they're on the same team now, which is different than what we've seen for a really long forever, basically. Yeah. Um, and then I'm like, these guys are used to going 200 miles an hour, and they're not going 200 miles an hour anymore yeah. for an entire whatever however really long you filmed it three weeks. So. Was your competitive or your need for speed itch uh, going off at all during that during that season? It was, but it was filled with us competing against once and uh, once. It's funny because we were still competing, even though we weren't competing against each other. Like yeah. me and Chuck would go, I go, Chuck, what'd you run on your draggy? And he'd go, I did this. And I go, yeah, but I did this. And so <laughs> then we were competing against each other on who had the faster draggy times, you know, and and yeah. we always joke around. But even though you're not competing against such each other, you still you still want to know like yeah but I got the, I mean you know out of our group I got the fastest car here which I didn't but right. that's what we all were going for so while it was not competitive and we were racing as a team we also were all of our cars the whole lot got faster as that show went on yeah and, and yeah. honestly I don't feel like that's any different than what happened to the OG show with big tires we pushed each other to this crazy realm of all these fast cars over here. And you give us another time enough time with that little small tire deal. And I feel like it'll head that direction, but yeah. And then we saw, we saw doc represent the four Oh five in the street wars. Uh, yeah. Finale. Yeah, he did his, his uh, docs Monte Carlo runs very, very good for sure. And it was, it was deceiving because, because he, I didn't think he was the fastest throw most of the year, you know, hey, but hey, we didn't sure either. like, honestly, and when I, when I, went to race him and he put me on the trailer at the race wars. I think it was the semifinals of the race wars. I didn't think, well, I knew his car was fast and we didn't take him lightly. Like I think we put more nitrous to that, to my big block Camaro than we had done probably the whole time because I was like, his car looks like it runs pretty good, but I don't think it's the fastest one here, but we don't want to be caught with our pants down. 
And then he puts a car or two on me on the big end. So his car obviously ran really, really well, even, even better than I don't think he knew it at the time. You know what I mean? But, mm-hmm. uh, but that thing ran good. Um, if he'd have cut a light against the Honda, like he yeah. cut against me, he'd have, that'd have been undoubtedly the, the king of the street on that night. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but his car's fast and, and, you know, those cars just work well. Anybody that's got those old school Monte Carlos uh, that, you know, that have done it, you know, anything similar to what he's got done as far as suspension goes, it just works really well. Now, I know how competitive you are, Ryan, and um, how your your expectations are you for you to win, you know, be at the top and win everything. In the 405 season, that wasn't the case. What were your – what what was your reaction to that? What, what did you – were you, was well, your competitive side coming out even more towards the end there when you're like, I might not have the fastest car here? Well, look, we were doing that as a team, right? So, you know, uh, if there was something – if there was something that I had to uh, not be the best at, then I picked it. That was it. Although we were, like I said, man, we were still very competitive. Like we, a lot of people, I think, think that we got in those cars and we raced them and then we took them home and then it was no big deal. And we showed up to race the next night or whatever, man, we were all in our shops thrashing on those stupid cars for a month straight. Like yeah. same deal. I remember being up till four or five in the morning, one morning working on my, working on a Camaro. I think we had to pull the heads off or something. Cause overheating going, this ain't. This is about the same as, as it is when we race big tires. The big tire cars in the street, at least you're not really, you're not really max effort on those things, you know. Like when it comes down to it, so we don't ever really hurt those on the street for the most part. But man, I was working on that small tire car every night, doing something to it. So I don't know. It's, I, hey, look, whatever competitive edge I may have lost during filming that show, I made up for it with how much fun we had. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um. Right, I started a new uh, little segment in my show. It's called yeah. it's called Did You Know, and what I do is I read off a couple stats um, of your of yours, a couple of good ones. Okay, I want to get your reaction to them, and then I'll get a, one that maybe is not so hot. So, <laughs> well, I don't want um, <laughs> So the first stat I want to do is uh, so Ryan Martin has an eight thirty one career win percentage in the final round of an MPK event. So the very last round, you win eighty three percent of the time. I mean, that's like the definition of clutch. In, if, if you want to compare it, Michael Jordan went to the finals six times and won six times. Yeah. You, you basically go to the finals seven times and you win six of them. So what are your, what are your thoughts? Like, they talk about the best, the best round to, to draw Ryan is the first round. It's totally not true. I've already looked at the stats, but, and you know that yeah. too. You had it in one of your videos. Like, yeah, yeah, true. yeah. And yeah. actually, the last round is not the best round to draw Ryan either. <laughs> Well, it's funny because there's a couple people who are always who who always tell me they always make sure they tell me before MPK race. Now I know if I get you on the first round, that's gonna be my best shot. We always laugh because we know better. You know, we always go, "Okay, buddy, we'll see what happens." You know, it yeah. turns out that I don't remember what you figured out. It seems like it turns out like second or third round or something was actually where the maybe- third round is. The third round is actually your worst round. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, that that and that and worse was, meaning uh you only win seventy six percent of the time. Yeah, okay, so. gotcha. Well, man, you know that's a that is a wild. I did not know that stat. You're right, that's a wild stat. I do know that by the time if you give me that many shots at that racetrack, by the time we're in the finals, we usually got a pretty good handle on stuff. You know, like I'm usually I'm usually pretty happy with my car. I'm usually know what tune up we need to go to. Um, I am not scared to, you know, and of course everybody knows that if I can have Petty at, at, at the track with me, he's going to be there and he's not either, but I've learned from him. I'm not scared to, you know, in the finals, if the track's good, we're going to throw the kitchen sink at it and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times my car is such a good car and it's such a well-built car. Uh, shout out to Bill Gilsbach, but um, it, it works so well, it usually takes what you throw at it. If the track, you know, without being stupid, you know what I mean? With, without taking mm-hmm. a track that's really slick and just putting all the power down. Um, if I want to go one of my faster tune-ups, it's going to be in the finals. And if I've done my job right and the car's done its job, that's when you're going to use it. So yeah, you got to have your your stuff together if you're going to race me in the finals. And you got to have as good a car as I have or <laughs> it ain't going to work out. So and you, you can't know. make any mistakes either. <laughs> no, you can't. And I and I another thing is I think I've been and I this might sound cocky and I don't mean it to be cocky, but like I've been to so many finals 
but I also don't get rattled in finals. Like a right. lot of people, you can watch them, and I, some of my friends, you know, I won't name names, but some of my friends get 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 rattled in the semis and in the finals and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I just look at it as another race, you know. And uh, a, a guy that I used to race with a long time ago told me, man, you can't, you know, your essentially your final round is not any different than your first round, and when it comes to how important it is, you know, you've got to get through every single one of them to get to your final round. And he told me that right after I red lit in the finals uh, at a World Ford Challenge after driving my car 30 miles and going 790s a bunch of times in a row and being the fastest guy there, I gave it away at the lap, you know, and it was the first time I'd really been on a big stage, yep. you know, and uh, and that was, I don't know, 2003 or four, something like that. Um, but ever since then, I just – I've made myself calm down and then, and then going to several finals has just kind of helped me get there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then you had brought it up about what's your worst round. Your worst round is the third round. And I had, and it's more specifically that's happened the last two seasons in particular. Um, and I was thinking about why could, you know, why could that possibly be? And th- there were two things I could, I could come up with. One of them was, I think that's about the time it switches from day to night. The track might Ooh, no. change during right. that time. Yeah. The other thing is, I was like, maybe, maybe Ryan just sandbanging the tune in, in, in no, round three. Dude, you, you he's nailed too it. Conservative right. or something. No, you nailed it. I know why it's the third round, and it's the threat that's the third round because it's a crapshoot on what racetrack you get. So you either got a hot, slimy racetrack still, or you mm-hmm. got a really good racetrack. And so I've been on both sides of that. I've missed the tune up because the track's been too good, and I've just gotten yeah. outran. And yeah. the, the one time I can think about that is. Swanstrom in Minnesota. Uh, I just didn't put enough tune up in it. He just, I just watched him drive away from me. And, um, and that was about in that time, that time period right there. And, you know, trying to power manage and do good, you've got to read the racetrack and you got to go, okay, it's hot and slimy, or it has made the transition to nighttime where now the track is good. And that yeah. for me is the most crucial time that I have to make those decisions is right there in that day and night so i personally feel like you you nailed it i mean i was going to say that exact thing before you got it out of your mouth i see there we go uh, i got one more stat for you so in your M- no prep case career yep. there are three drivers who have a winning record or are even with you do you know do you know who those three drivers are i'm sorry say that i'm trying to wrap my head around that say that one more time so there's three drivers who yep. have a winning record against you or an even record with you only Ooh, three. okay um for some reason, I want to say I, this is weird, but I want to say Larry Larson. Yep, he's even okay. with you. Okay, and I thought so. That's because he kicked my ass the first season. He was really fast the first couple seasons. Yes, yeah. yeah, the first season and maybe the first two seasons. Yeah. Um, and then, God, I don't know. You're gonna have to tell me the other two. Teammates, Odom and How. Odom and how? Oh, yeah, because they're the newest guys. Yep. They're the newest guys, and they've got their stuff together relatively quickly, and they brought a competitive car pretty fast. So yeah. I've done – it's crazy. There's been a couple times uh, – it's funny because I can think of all the times they've beat me or I beat them or whatever the case is because because collectively it's not like the rest of the guys where I've raced them for five years, you know? No, um, no. I've done stupid shit against Odom. Um, I've gone red against him twice, I think. Um, and then I know Jim got me on a guess one time, like left on a Monday, the race was on a Tuesday type thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that, that was, though, that does not surprise me whatsoever. Okay. It's interesting, but I did, I definitely did not know that. I knew that, I knew that Larry Larson was one of them because I, I had kind of remembered, I may have seen one of your stats before that you posted and mm-hmm. I looked at it and I thought, well, yeah, because he used to kick my ass all over season one and two. So he, he was fast. He, used to he be was. Fast. Yeah. He was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if you want, right, Ryan, uh, yeah. we'll take a couple of questions from okay. people in chat. Um, so sure. if you're watching, put your questions in the chat. I mean, Ryan will look and answer a couple of them. Um, while we're doing that, Ryan, I'm going to um, shout out a couple of my partners that I have. If that yes, is okay. absolutely. All right. For any and all No Prep Racing news, not just Street Outlaws, go to NoPrep.com or the No Prep Racing page on Facebook. This is the number one source for all things No Prep, so be sure to check it out. Are you looking for a quick access firearm storage system that has a variety of access control levels based on your needs? 
we'll head on over to DoorGunnerUSA.com, a family-owned business who makes their products 100% right here in the USA. If you're in the business for motorsports, automotive, or event photography, look no further than Annette Bauer Creative. She specializes in photography as well as social media management and partnership consultations. You can find her on Instagram or through her website at AnnetteBauerCreative.com. I also want to give one special shout out to a lady named Lori Lane. She runs a private Facebook group called Street Outlaws and Drag Racing. She's a huge fan of Ryan Martin. She's a huge fan of all Street Outlaws. She's a huge fan of the Stack Guy Show. So I want to give a special shout out to her. Yeah, um, yeah. being a fan. All right, Ryan, did you see any? Have you seen any questions that uh, were interesting to you? I have not seen any cheap questions, so that's the first. Um, ever yeah, I don't see any live questions. Meeting. On my end, I don't have any questions, period. So I'm going to have to. Oh, you can't see any? No. Okay. So I'll let you pick the questions you can ask me since the only thing I can see is Stat Guy Show, episode 19 with Ryan Martin, time and time again. (laughs) That's the only thing I see on the front. It's going to be ingrained in your head now. Yeah, right. Uh, All right. We've got a question here uh, from C Money. It says, Does Ryan think this will be the closest no prep season ever? Uh, that is a great question. And I feel like I have said that to myself almost every season. Um, I'm surprised last season. Uh, I think the screw guys just got a com a handle on their combo late. Had they got a, a, a handle on their combination early last season could have been different. Um, but yes, I mean, I think a lot of these guys are going into this. There's, you know, I would be surprised if there's a whole lot of people changing combinations, which means that's repetitive, right? So it's going to be repetitive for them. So, I, yeah, I do think so. I think the rules are going to even up, bring up some of the turbo guys up to the top forefront. Um, we, we haven't really talked about nitrous combos. And the nitrous combos got weight breaks. And, you know, I know Lizzie's staying nitrous from what I can hear. And in Kai, maybe not so much, but, man – that nitrous combination is going to be tough too. So I would say yes. I mean, there's almost no way that it can't be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's going to have um, to be good. a question here from Quentin Nelson. Um, it says, how do you feel about Kai switching the blower? I had a comment real quick about this. Sure. Um, I've seen, we've seen you guys, we've seen you switch from season to season, from turbos to uh, pro charger. We've seen swans from switch in the season. In my opinion, I think if you're fast and you know what you're doing, I don't care. It doesn't matter what combo you run. You know, I think, I think Kai's going to be fast. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, it, honestly, the same thing. I mean, look, and Kai and I have had this conversation. I personally feel like if I'm Kai Kelly, I stay nitrous because, like, I'm a nitrous guy. And I know the reasons why he needs to change and wants to change, and I understand that. But especially with the fact of the matter that this could potentially be, you know, with a weight break. And I mean, look, it, it, it I think if Kai could get out there and take advantage of the weight breaks and change his car up a little bit, I would say, man, he's silly to not to, to change away from nitrous. But if he doesn't do that and he doesn't put a bunch of titanium in his car and he doesn't change his car up a bunch, this is the next best way to get to the top. Um, it, I don't think it's going to hurt him as a player for the game. I think he's still going to be a top five guy uh, because – he has a drive to to race. He has a drive to win, um, and he usually has the right people helping him, no matter what he's doing. So, I think Kai's going to do good. Uh, I don't know that I agree with it for him, but I think he's going to do good with it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I got one more question for you, Brian. That's sure. what I had written down. I forgot to ask it. Um, okay. We've seen a lot of No Prep Kings teams um, adding new guys this year already, or bringing on future guys. Um, especially like Team Cali, I think they're going to make a big splash this year. What about the 405? Is, 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 are you guys bringing some guys back who made it, maybe raced a year or two ago? Any, any new guys that are just on the 405 show, but now they're going to do no prep kings? Um, you know, I think da- everybody's seen Damon uh, racing on the street show. I think you'll see Damon more this year um, nice. as he has geared his car up more to compete at the no prep kings level. Um, it, so I think you'll see him more, um, Kamikaze Chris, I think is getting close to finishing a car to, uh, start competing again back at MPK. Um, but then as far as that goes, I think it's just all the normal guys, you know, yeah. um, 
but you, you you did hit the nail on the head with something like I I saw something on Instagram or something um, about Team Cali, and it looks like they got like twenty five members in their in their <laughs> team now. So they've got a lot of cars. So if they're really bringing all those cars, there it's going to be tough. Uh, they're going to be tough just for and just, you know. There's a what do they say? Um, there's power in numbers, right? So yeah. it may be tough just because of how many cars they have. Right. Right. No, I agree. hundred uh, percent. Well, Ryan, as always, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, yeah. come, come chat with me. Let me ask you some questions. Um, for sure. Huge fan as always. Um, I wish you the best of luck this year. I'm going to come meet you again. See you again at Ohio in the first race. Come on. Um, we, we, got luck, you ticket. we got you a ticket if you're coming and, just so you know, I'm also a huge fan of yours. I appreciate everything you do for us and all of our stat stuff that we would never think to to come up with. Um, you've taught me more about my racing career than I even know. So I, I appreciate you very much. Well, thank you so much, man. Thank you for coming on the show again. All right, buddy. See you later. Have a good night.